Okay, so welcome to video two of this week's learning. So in the first video, we looked at factors that affect air resistance and drag. Now in this video, we are going to be looking at factors that affect horizontal distance traveled by a projectile. We are going to look at free body diagrams and the resolution of forces that act on that projectile in flight. And we're going to look at parabolic and non-parabolic flight paths. Video three, we will cover lift force, angle of attack, and the Bernoulli principle, and we will look at spin and the Magnus effect. So let's get started. So projectile motion. This is basically a term that's used to describe the movement of a body through the air following a curved flight path under the force of gravity. So a projectile is a body that is launched into the air and it's subjected to weight and air resistance forces. So for example, you can have an athlete, like a high jumper, or you can have equipment like a javelin, a shot put, a discus. Once in flight, a projectile will follow a flight path through the air. The flight path from start to finish will show the overall distance travelled after gravity has accelerated it back to ground. So, a quick activity. I want you to imagine you are throwing a tennis ball as far as you can. What would make the ball go further? Why would that make the ball go further? I want you to consider what if someone was stood in front of you trying to stop you throwing the ball. Take a couple of minutes, pause the video, have a think about this activity. Okay, so let's look into the theory behind it because you might have come up with things like, well, throwing the ball harder might make it go further or throwing the ball higher might make it go further. If someone was stood in front of you, it might mean that you don't throw the ball as, as far because you can't throw it in the direction you want to. Let's have a look. So the fly path of a projectile can be presented in a simple graph, height against distance traveled. So this diagram shows trajectories, which is another word for flight path, of throws in baseball. So you can see that generally speaking, the lower the height that it's thrown, the less distance it travels. The higher it's thrown, the further it tends to travel. Okay. Now, that graph gives a very quick visual impression of the shape of the flight path and the distance travelled. It can indicate what has affected the flight path as well. So there are four factors that will affect the distance travelled by a projectile. They are the speed of release, the angle of release, the height of release and aerodynamic factors. We are going to look at the first three in this video. So the speed of release. Horizontal distance travelled by a projectile is primarily affected by the speed of the release. The faster you release it, the greater it's going to go. So if you think to um, Newton's second law of motion that states a body's rate of change of momentum is proportional to the size of the force applied and acts in the same direction as the force applied. What that means is, the greater force applied to the projectile when we throw it, the greater the acceleration and the further it will travel. So Olympic throwers will train to generate maximum power from their muscle mass in their arm, shoulder and chest region to try and transfer as much force into that projectile as possible upon release. The angle of release is also important. So if the speed remains unchanged on release, the angle of release will affect the horizontal distance travelled. So you could put the same amount of force into a projectile, um, but if you throw it at a different angle, it will travel a different distance. A 90 degree projectile will go vertically up and vertically down and will travel zero metres. A 45 degree projectile angle will maximise horizontal distance. That is the general rule. 45 degrees is the magic angle. Less than, uh, sorry, greater than 45 degrees, but less than 90 degrees, so 60 or 75 degrees, a projectile will reach its peak height far too quickly and then it will rapidly return to ground. Whereas lower than 45 degrees, a projectile doesn't achieve sufficient height to maximise flight time, so it doesn't travel as far. So you can see here this diagram, you can see how 90 degrees it's just going to go up and down. Too high, it's going to reach its peak too soon and then come back down. And here, 45 degrees, the magic angle, 30 degrees, not enough height for it to be able to get anywhere. So the third factor is height of release. So if the release height and the landing height are the same, 
then 45 degrees is the optimum angle of release. However, if the height of release is higher or lower than the landing height, then the optimal angle will change. So for example, we have here a javelin thrower. Now, the javelin is being released from his hand, but where it lands is the ground. So the release height is higher than the landing height. And therefore, the optimal angle needs to be slightly lower to account for that. So actually, the optimal angle in javelin throwing is around 35 degrees rather than the, the general 45 degrees. If the javelin was landing at the same height as it was released, it would be 45 degrees. You can see that's a great distance. But here, the 35 degrees will take it further. So examples are, you know, javelin, we've looked at the optimal angle of release is less than 45 degrees because the projectile already has an increased flight time due to the increased height of release. However, if the release height is below the landing height, for example, a bunker shot in golf, so that the golf ball is, is below the grass that it would be landing on, then the optimal angle of release is more than 45 degrees so it would probably be more like 60 degrees in order to get the projectile um, to have the increased flight time to overcome the obstacle. So looking at flight paths, projectiles in flight. So once released a projectile will follow a flight path that has been determined to, by the relative size of the forces acting upon it. A true flight path of a projectile completely unaffected by air resistance um, would be parabolic. So what that means is it's a uniform curve that is symmetrical about its higher point. Okay, So it is symmetrical from this point here. And that's known as a parabolic flight path. Um, and flight paths are described rel relative to that parabolic shape. So what would affect a projectile in flight? We're talking about weight and air resistance. So depending on the dominant force, the flight path will be more or less parabolic in nature. So a parabolic flight path is if weight is the dominant force and air resistance is very small, then it, the, the flight path will be more parabolic. So for example, a shot put, it has a very high mass, it travels at a low velocity with a relatively small frontal cross-sectional area and a smooth surface, so it has relatively low air resistance. Therefore, its flight path tends to be a parabolic shape, symmetrical about its highest point because weight is the dominant force, it has a high mass. However, non-parabolic flight paths are determined by air resistance being the dominant force. So if weight is relatively small and you have high air resistance, then a non-parabolic flight path will occur. So for example, a badminton shuttle. It has a very low mass, it travels at high velocities, and it has a relatively uneven surface which will increase air resistance. So the shape of a flight path, um, for a shuttlecock's flight path, would be non-parabolic. You can see it's not symmetrical about the top of its peak. So if you think back to a few lessons ago when we did free body diagrams, um, what are their purpose? What did we have to include? Pause the video, take a minute, have a bit of a recap. Okay, so a free body diagram is a sketch to show all the forces acting on a body at a particular instant in time. And we have to include the forces that are acting, where they originate, the direction they're going, the relative sizes of the forces, and a direction of motion arrow. So there are three main faces of motion within a flight path. What do you think they could be? Pause the video, have a think. They are your start of your flight, your mid-flight, and your end of flight. They are our three phases. Weight will not change throughout. Weight will remain the same the whole way. Air resistance may change depending on the velocity of the projectile. Um, so when will air resistance be greatest during the flight of a shuttlecock? When, what do we think? Well, it's going to be greatest at the start of the flight. And this is because um, at the start of the flight, the velocity is just being hit by the racket. The velocity is at its highest. And therefore, it will cause deceleration because the higher velocity will, will increase the air resistance. Um, and then that causes deceleration, 
which reduces the air resistance until its highest point and then weight becomes the dominant force. So let's draw three free body diagrams to, to show a shot put in flight. So we've got the start of the flight, we've got the direction of motion, and we have the parabolic flight path. So where should the arrows for weight and air resistance originate from? Which direction should they point? Well, the answer is they originate from the centre of mass of the projectile. The weight goes downwards. The air resistance is the opposite to the direction of motion. Now, the arrow here is going towards the right. However, we have to follow the flight path with the direction of motion. And therefore, the air resistance will, arrow will change direction depending on what phase of the flight path the shot put is in. So you've got your weight arrow and your air resistance arrow. See, it is in the opposite direction to the flight path. You then have mid-flight, so you've got your weight and your air resistance. Remember, low air resistance for a shot put, high weight. And then end of the flight, weight, air resistance. And this is how you draw a, th a free body diagram to show the three different phases of flight. So, over to you. I would like you to pause the video and I would like you to draw three free body diagrams to show the forces acting on a shuttlecock. Remember, think about how this will differ to the shot put diagrams we did and why. Um, an extension task is to describe what is happening at each stage of your diagram and why. Okay, pause the video, have a go. Okay, so this is what you should have got. Now, we don't necessarily always have to draw the object on there. You could have drawn a little triangle if you wanted to. But here we have the start of the flight, so weight is low, air resistance is high, we've got the direction of our motion, we've got our non-parabolic flight path. At the peak, mid-flight, again weight is low, air resistance is still relatively high, and then again here Weight is exactly the same, unchanged, quite low, air resistance high. Just notice how the air resistance arrow changes. Okay, so here we have a high velocity, high air resistance. Here it changes and the air resistance reduces slightly as it drops down. Okay, so pause the video and I'd like you to try and complete this um, table drawing a free body diagram to represent mid-flight for a shot put and a shuttlecock. I want you to say what the dominant force would be and the resulting flight path. Okay, so this is what you should have got. So a free body diagram, you can see shot put, the weight arrow is large, shuttle, the weight arrow is low. We've got a direction of motion arrow on there and we've got our air resistance arrow in the opposite direction, air resistance arrow for the shuttlecock being larger. So the dominant force is the weight, is the dominant force over air resistance for the shot put, whereas for the shuttlecock it's air resistance over weight, and therefore the shot put flight path would be parabolic, and the shuttlecock flight path would be non-parabolic. Okay. So we don't just draw free body diagrams, we can also create from those free body diagrams a parallelogram of forces. So this will consider the result of all forces acting on a projectile in flight. So it's a resultant force. Um, and we use a parallelogram and a free body diagram with weight and air resistance arrows. So let's look at an example. So if we take a shot put in mid-flight. So we draw the free body diagram showing the weight and the air resistance. We then add broken parallel lines to the weight and the air resistance to create the parallelogram. We then draw a diagonal line from the origin of weight and air resistance, the centre of mass, to the opposite corner of the parallelogram and we label that arrow the resultant force. So you can see from this diagram where the main force is acting upon the shot put. Now if you are asked to draw this in your exam, don't just add it onto your free body diagram. You need to draw a fresh new diagram from scratch. Over to you. So can you do exactly the same for a shuttlecock mid-flight? Can you draw a, a parallelogram of forces for a shuttlecock mid-flight? Pause the video, have a go.
<clears throat> okay, so if we compare, so this is our shot put taken from the previous slide. This is something of what you should have got for your shuttle. So we've got here centre of mass, we've got the air resistance is a larger arrow, the weight is a shorter arrow and the resultant force is further back. Now, if you compare the parallelogram, what do you notice? Well you notice that in the shot put the resultant force, this purple line, is much closer to the weight arrow. This says to us that the dominant force is weight and then the, that means the flight will be more parabolic. However, with this diagram, the resultant force is much closer to the air resistance and therefore the air resistance will be the dominant force and the flight will be non-parabolic in nature. The resultant force arrow for both projectiles show that deceleration is occurring and it shows what direction that acceler acceler deceleration is occurring in. So here the deceleration is going further down and here it's, it's going downwards still but less at a less rate. Okay, so that concludes video two. Once you've completed all the tasks, then you can move on to video three.